Today's online presentation focuses on the politics of Prince Edward Island, featuring insights from Dr. Don Desrud from UPEI. I'd remind everyone who's tuning in live or afterwards to visit our blog to ask any questions or join the discussion. We're found at provincialpolitics.blogspot.ca. A former professor in, um, in political science at UNB St. John and the director of the Urban and Community Studies Institute, Dr. Don Desrud, has also served as Associate Dean of Graduate Studies and Dean of Arts at UPEI, where he's presently a professor of political science. Originally from Bathurst, uh, New Brunswick, Dr. Desrud has a BA and an MA from Dalhousie University and a PhD in political science from the University of Western Ontario. He also has an MA in English and creative writing from UNB. His research interests include parliaments and legislative assemblies, and he frequently comments on political issues uh, on local and national media. We're very fortunate to have Don with us here tonight, and with that, I'll turn the floor over to you to talk a little bit about PEI politics. Okay, thanks very much, Jared. So just let me set this up here, and we'll get started. Okay, so here we go, Prince Edward Island. A uh, little picture of our university, by the way, at the top of the screen there. Another picture, this is a, a scene on the far, far east coast of Prince Edward Island, near a place called Panmere Island. It's giving you a sense of just the uh, natural beauty of the island and the glorious beaches that we have. And here's where we are situated geographically in North America. Um, one point of showing you this slide, by the way, is to show just how very small Prince Edward Island is, easily dwarfed by the rest of the, of the continent, uh, and the rather precarious nature it looks like it's dangling there on the on the east coast of Canada. Uh, and I have a, the a theory that this actually affects the political culture of the island. The precariousness is something that islanders live with on a daily basis. Uh, very fretful people. They worry a lot about what's going on. Another sample of that map. And this is us, this is Prince Edward Island within the three maritime provinces. So you saw New Brunswick uh, and on, on uh, the green uh, section is New Brunswick, the blue Nova Scotia, and that red piece, Prince Edward Island. And this is a little bit of a map. Uh, not a particularly large island, uh, but it's about 400 kilometers from tip to tip if you were driving along that, uh, that highway number two. Uh, when you compare it to Ontario, which is the largest province, uh, you really see the, the disparity um, and the differences that we have in this country uh, amongst our, our provinces. So Ontario being the largest province with a population of uh, well over 13 million now um, compared to Prince Edward Island, population of 145,000. Uh, there are suburbs in Toronto with many more people. So, as someone once told me, there is apartment blocks in Toronto with more people. Uh, so we really are very, very small, but beautiful. Um, scenery is spectacular, uh, and the islander, islanders take their scenery very, very seriously, something that they're very, very proud of. Uh, it's the only island with provincial status. There are other islands, obviously, in Canada, uh, but this is the only province that is entirely an island. Uh, it had been a long time ago, the Ile de Saint-Jean, or St. John's Island, but became British uh, with the Treaty of Paris and was renamed eventually um, to be Prince Edward Island. A uh, bit of curious uh, history, it was actually founded, the government was, by mistake. Originally the idea was that once uh, Prince Edward Island became part of, uh, of, of, the, of the British colonies, it was supposed to become a territory or maybe even a province of the larger province of Nova Scotia, which at that time included both New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Uh, so the idea was that this would just be incorporated as another county, perhaps, in another way to look at it, of, of the larger territory. And the Lieutenant Governor, Michael Franklin, uh, in Halifax, was sent up to uh, establish a, a, a regional county-type government, and either accidentally or perhaps on purpose, he decided to misread his mandate and uh, ended up by, by creating an independent government. Um, and because uh, things take a long time to be found out, by the time the British government uh, realized what had happened, it was too late, and, and, and it had been established as an independent colony, and they decided they might as well uh, continue on that way. So a bit, bit of a curious history of the province that was created by mistake. First parliament that was brought together, uh, 1773, not very many people were, lived on Prince Edward Island at the time. Uh, 
rather scattered. They gathered in a tavern downtown, an appropriate place, I thought, perhaps, for, a, for the first parliament. And the, the uh, bouncer at the, at the tavern was the first uh, sergeant at arms. And uh, he was rather uh, uh, put off by this strange crew that arrived. And, and he was uh, heard to exclaim, this is a rather damn queer parliament. Uh, and so one of the very first acts of the, of the assembly was to find the, the doorman for, for uh, contempt. <laughs> so uh, um, they didn't uh, take that uh, as a compliment. Um, and, uh, but it has been an odd assembly ever since, quite frankly, though eventually, uh, 1851, we did become, uh, did receive our responsible government as we have today. Charlottetown Conference in 1864 is uh, quite famous. The story of, uh, of, the, of the three maritime um, colonies coming together in Charlottetown for a meeting on maritime union is well known. Uh, crashed by the delegates from uh, what was then the colony of Canada, so over in Lower Canada together, to convince them to uh, join a much larger union, which, which would eventually become the British North America uh, Federation. Uh, Prince of Island, of course, also famously refused to join. The uh, reason why was because the main uh, incentive for uh, the, the uh, British North America uh, Confederacy was the, the trading links uh, and that linking the, the, the maritime provinces and their, and, and their uh, harbors to uh, uh, the trade possibilities in, in Canada and the, and the expansion out west. And so an island didn't see much of an advantage to that. Uh, they were an island, didn't have ready access to, to the markets on the mainland and uh, therefore refused to join. Um, uh, or declined to join, I suppose. Um, this hasn't stopped Prince Edward Island from celebrating uh, 2014 as a, a very historical, important event, and the, this whole year has been uh, um, wrapped up with all sorts of festivals and events and contests and all sorts of things celebrating an event that, uh, ironically enough, we uh, did not um, partake. However, we did eventually join Confederation in 1873, and the, what made it uh, possible, uh, a lot of nudging and cajoling, of course, uh, by the powers that be, but also that there was a promise that there'd be some kind of a link, a reliable link to the mainland uh, would be created. It wasn't exactly clear what that reliable link would be. Would it be a ferry? Later on, it was uh, it suggested that it should be a tunnel. A causeway was, was proposed as well. Uh, but it is it did, did become part of the uh, of the of the uh, terms of, of, of union for Prince Edward Island to join the Confederation that the federal federal government would maintain a reliable link uh, to the mainland and that was the incentive that uh, Prince Edward Island needed. Uh, just some famous premiers uh, that have been on the island: uh, Alex Campbell, 1966 to 1978. A new book just came out about uh, uh, Premier Campbell called "The Premier Who Rocked the Cradle." Uh, the cradle is a common word that, that is used to describe Prince of Island. It goes back to the, the old Mi'kmaq name for the, uh, the island, which means that it was called the cradle in the, in the, in the sea. Um, and uh, rocking the cradle is an interesting uh, bit of a double entendre there. Uh, did he rock them as, a, uh, as in soothing, or did he rock them as, a, as getting them riled up? Uh, Campbell did a bit of both. Uh, Joe Giz, another famous premier, uh, 1986 to 1993, uh, so it was well, well respected, and uh, both these premiers, by the way, had national profiles, which is something that matters a lot to Islanders that their premiers do very well. Current politics: it's a 27-seat legislature. The Liberal government uh, right now has 23 of those seats. Uh, these these kinds of, uh, of large majorities are not uncommon in Prince Edward Island. Uh, most governments seem to be one or the other. They're either conservative or they're liberal, and they use they tend to be very large. So a couple of times they've been very close, and almost to a tie but uh, sweeps tend to be more common. Right now, the progressive conservative opposition has only three seats. Uh, one of those seats is independent, and the reason why that seat is independent is, is kind of interesting in itself. Uh, it's held by the former PC leader, Olive Crane. Um, now, why this is interesting, uh, it's, it's an interesting on a number of fronts, not the least of which is that party identification in Prince of Island is very, very serious. So you're either a liberal or a conservative, and the other parties do not really have much of a standing or, or a following. And these party labels, not unusual in the Maritimes, you find the same in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, uh, are something that people uh, go from generation to generation to generation. You are, you are definitely of that party. Uh, it is important to you as your religion. Um, so the fact that uh, the PC leader is, is now seen as independent 
has to do with the number of events that took place just after the last election. Uh, she was not a popular choice as, as leader. Uh, there was lots of, lots of controversy over her selection. She did manage to improve the party standings from, at that time from four seats before the last election to five in 2011, but that wasn't good enough. Uh, and uh, she eventually lost the support of her party, and she was forced to resign. Uh, but she had uh, uh, one strong ally, uh, Hal Perry, and, and obviously another PC MLA. And um, although these, this story didn't come forward till much later, we found out that uh, Hal Perry and uh, Olive Crane were so fed up with their own party that they actually approached the Liberals and asked if they could cross the floor. Well. Um, the Liberals were happy to have Mr. Perry, but they uh, reportedly said to uh, Olive Crane, uh, sorry, uh, you know, your performance in the last election and all those nasty things that you said about us, uh, heat of the campaign, of course, uh, are such that we don't particularly uh, want you as a, uh, as a member of our party. Uh, her own party got wind of it. She had been talking to Liberals across the floor, and they immediately expelled her from caucus. So she was now uh, the independent. So a bit of a peculiar uh, situation, but uh, there are lots of interesting stories like that in Prince of Don politics. Right now, so we have uh, Premier Robert Giz. Uh, you recognize that name. He's the son of Joe Giz, the Premier that I highlighted a few slides back. Uh, he's liberal. Um, and then you have Stephen Myers leading the very small uh, Tory opposition. There's party standings uh, and election results over the last couple of years, and you'll see what I mean by the swing. So in 2000, it was the PCs, the 26 seats, and the Liberals only only one. They held on to that large number of 23 in 2003, but then in 2007 it flipped. So you have now four for the PCs, 23 for the Liberals, and then the situation at the election time, 2011, five for the PCs, and 22, and uh, as I said, that's now uh, 23 and uh, three and one. And here's some popular vote figures, uh, again, reflecting the, the swings. A uh, large, large majority uh, for the PCs in 2000 and 2003, going down in 2007 and 2011, whereas the Liberals do the opposite. Uh, but you'll notice that even when the PCs had only a few seats, they still have a very substantial number of votes. Uh, that's an example of how the first class and post system tends to exaggerate results. Um, that also shows that uh, a small swing of voters uh, can lead to a, a huge a number of uh, a, a swings in, in, in the number of seats. Also, you'll notice on that graph that the uh, that chart that uh, the other parties have not fared very well uh, and don't seem to be making much progress. So the NDP managed to get all the way up to 8.4% in 2000, uh, but steadily declined. Latest opinion polls show that the NDP are doing fairly well. Uh, they, were in, they were up around 10 and over 10 percent, but uh, whether that translates into seats the next election is a good question. Probably not, by the way. Green Party, same situation. Uh, they're still relatively new on the island, running candidates in 2007, uh, but they have a very small number of, of, uh, of voters for it, no seats whatsoever. And then a new party that showed up in 2011 is the Island Party. There's their, their crest. Um, New Brunswick has had a kind of agrarian social protest party on the right, you know, the core party, uh, People's Party in New Brunswick. Uh, in the core party in New Brunswick actually managed to win eight seats in 1991 and formed the official opposition. So there's a streak of, of sort of right wing uh, agrarian populism in New Brunswick. Not a lot of evidence of that in Prince Edward Island, but the Island Party was. A sort of a party like that, or at least I think that's what it was trying to trying to uh, model itself on, um, didn't do well at all. As I showed, as you saw with those with that last uh, slide, only 0.7 percent of the of the eligible voters uh, chose the Allen Party. But there's still an interesting group to watch. Uh, I don't even know if they'll frankly if they'll run candidates in the next election. Their slogan was the Island for Islanders. Uh, and you can read a lot of meaning into a, a slogan like that. Um, bring back the island for the islanders. Great suspicion of people who are not from the island uh, pervades that party and frankly is, is, I would argue, part of the political culture of Prince Edward Island. Now, being an islander, I, I will tell you that I, I, I experience it on a daily basis. 
Voting turnout, Prince of Island is famous for its high levels of voting turnout, even during great storms when Hurricane Juan came through. Uh, they never less, it happened to be on election day, nevertheless the voting turnout was only blipped down a tiny bit. Uh, but you'll notice on this chart that I'm showing you now that in 2011 there was a, a, quite a, a, a precipitous decline from 2007 to 2011. And that's an interesting question too. Not sure whether that's an aberration, whether it'll flip back up again in the next election, or whether an indication that something's not quite right. Uh, right now, my instinct tells me that something is not quite right, that there's a dissatisfaction with the Liberals, but the Conservatives are just not a, a uh, alternative for them, and, uh, and the NDP and the Greens have not made any kind of uh, inroads there. So people are staying home rather than vote for the party, uh, the Liberals in this case, um, and, and in some cases, in, in some, and probably in some cases the Conservatives too, um, so they're dissatisfied with, with the party, don't like what's going on, but aren't ready to switch parties yet. So their voting protest is uh, is to, to not vote, and I think that might be responsible for a rather sharp and surprising decline between 2007 and 2011. Some stuff about the economy that that might be important. It's a very small province, so the GDP is not very much, about five billion dollars. Uh, the economy is very dependent upon federal transfers. There's a lot of money gets transferred from the federal government to Prince Edward Island in also different ways, including uh, jobs. There, 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 there is a substantial federal civil service that over the years has been relocated at Prince Edward Island, Veterans Affairs, for example, uh, and uh, it, it carrying a heavy debt load. So the GDP, the, the debt to GDP ratio is not great, obviously. Not the worst in Canada, by the way, but it's still rather large for a very small province. And they're running a, a significant deficit, though, as the finance minister is telling us about deficit is uh, going down and will continue to go down in time for the next election. Uh, but he says what finance ministers always say, and uh, rarely those, those those numbers are almost always being revised. Uh, what are the main industries? Uh, the four big ones are agricultural, fisheries, biotech, and aerospace. Um, those are the ones that uh, the, the economy depends upon. Uh, the last two have run into a lot of trouble. There's an awful lot of optimism that this was moving the province away from the, uh, the traditional industries like agriculture and fisheries uh, into the, 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 the more high-tech and value-added industries like biotech and aerospace. But they've had a number of setbacks recently, and that, that's been very, very frustrating. Um, though the uh, biggest employer on the island tends to be uh, in the retail trade and in, in, and in uh, different industries that are attached to tourism, like the restaurant industry. Tourism, in fact, is probably the fastest growing industry. That shouldn't surprise anyone. It is a tourism destination of choice. Uh, and the uh, province has been quite uh, uh, shameless in trying to exploit the, the works of uh, Lucy Mont Montgomery and Anna Green Gables uh, very successfully. Uh, and people flock from all over. Uh, you've probably heard stories of the Japanese tourists that, that absolutely love Anna Green Gables. Uh, well, those are they're true. They're, it's, it's quite remarkable to see the number of people that come see all the different sites uh, where they can find something to do with Anna Green Gables. There's musicals, plays that are put on. Uh, and if you're on the, the Cavendish shore where, where uh, uh, Lucy Montgomery set many of her, her novels, you'll find every bit of tourism uh, attraction you can, you can imagine um, from amusement parks to um, wax museums and everything in between, all of which will have something to do, some name, some attachment, some connection to, to the Anna Green Gables stories. Uh, an industry that is growing and, and has become really interesting uh, for the island is the cruise ship industry. So the Maritimes in general have enjoyed quite a uh, bonanza uh, in, in uh, cruise ships, uh, a relatively new market only in the last 20 years that this, that this has happened. And they've been slowly expanding. Uh, Halifax was, the, was a port of choice. St. John and New Brunswick is now, now receiving a lot of uh, cruise ships and now Charlottetown as well. Um, and this, is, uh, this has been an interesting development because it, it means that the waterfront has to be developed in order to accommodate these cruise ships and that has uh, uh, convinced uh, people in, in, in city planners, for example, to start thinking very carefully about waterfront development, something that ironically enough, given that we're a maritime region, doesn't get a lot of attention in the, in the maritimes. Um, but uh, they've been uh, an interesting uh, change and has uh, really uh, added a lot to the, to the summer. Uh, also, obviously, crowds of tourists, which uh, locals don't always appreciate, but they certainly like when it comes to money. Uh, harness racing is a huge uh, 
concern, going concern on Prince Edward Island. It's, it's a long history of harness racing. There's a very famous uh, um, uh, race, uh, an event called the uh, the Gold Cup, uh, which takes place uh, in a couple of weeks in August. It's actually a civic holiday. It's so important. They have a big parade through the, through the streets of Charlottetown, and uh, uh, it's a, everybody has the day off to go to go and watch the race. Uh, so that's a big deal, and that has that has also generated all sorts of other off uh, off track revenues. Um, and uh, music festivals, so uh, Summerside and uh, also up in Cavendish Beach, they've been uh, uh, bringing in a lot of high-level, high-top high, high uh, performers. Shania Twain, I think, is coming this weekend, and people are pretty excited with that. Uh, or maybe that's Labor Day weekend, but whatever, she's coming soon. And uh, we've, had a, we've had a lot of uh, performers that come and perform at these people in the air festivals and also concert halls, and that's been a great draw for tourists as well. But it's our climate. Well, it's, it's uh, uh, relatively mild. Um, and it has, uh, as the tourist brochures will tell you, very warm water uh, at the beaches, um, which because because basically the the, the uh, land surrounding Prince Edward Island under the water is, is uh, the water is shallow, and that therefore it heats up, and so you have these beautifully uh, this beautiful warm water that you, that you can swim in, and it's uh, claimed to be the warmest uh, beaches north of the Carolinas. Um, it also claims Prince Edward Island does to be Canada's second warmest province. Uh, this is statistically true. It's a great example of how you can use the statistic to uh, uh, present a point, even though it doesn't uh, uh, intuitively make a, make a whole lot of sense. Uh, so yeah, it actually is the second warmest province in Canada if you uh, look at the average uh, the mean temperature of the, the province over a year. Nova Scotia, by the way, is the warmest. New Brunswick is the is the third warm, so that the three maritime provinces are the warmest provinces in Canada. And if you ask yourself, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because uh, you've been here, for example, it's a time of year when it's not so warm. Uh, you know, uh, it's uh, this is my backyard, and I will tell you that winters are not at all warm. So how does that make sense that we are um, the warmest province? Well, uh, it has everything to do with the fact that uh, when you're looking at the average temperature of the province, you're looking at the average temperature throughout the entire province. A province like Alberta has a, high, a far north uh, or the northern part of the province and a southern part of the province, Quebec, the same thing. The average of all those provinces, obviously the average decreases. And so Island being very tiny doesn't have that. So uh, it's uh, it's true, but it's also a good way in which the statistic can be manipulated to, to make a point that uh, doesn't exactly tell you the whole story. Um, the burning question in Prince Edward Island that has never gone away, and it's an interesting part of our political culture, is what is called the land question. And this has to do with the origins of the island itself. So what was supposed to happen after the island changed hands uh, and became part of the, uh, the British colonial system was that they, would, they, they planned on settling the land by uh, uh, surveying it, dividing it up into what are called lots, uh, and then they would uh, auction these lots off to... Uh, Make basically friends of the court, who would then be uh, who, who then own these lots, and their job would be uh, in in uh, as the way in which they pay back the fact that they got this property uh, was be to settle and and develop the lots. They didn't have to live there, so they ended up by having these absentee proprietors who would then rent their land to people they would bring in. Scottish Highlanders were one of the biggest groups, uh, and then the and the Scottish Highlanders would then farm the land, clear the land, farm the land, develop it, but they'd never own it. And this went on for a very, very long time, and the, and the, and the people who actually owned the land uh, had very little connection to it. So this, this became a burning issue, which, which uh, has still to this day resonates with Islanders, this idea of an absentee landowner reaping the benefits by someone else's hard work who isn't allowed to own the land. Didn't actually settle the question of land ownership until well after Confederation uh, and after Prince Edward Island joined Confederation. There is a, a, also a myth that uh, pervades uh, Prince Edward Island culture. It's called the garden myth, uh, and this affects decision making, policy making, voting choices, uh, a lot of different things, politically, socially, uh, and in culture as well. Uh, it is a very beautiful island. It's a very small island. I start off the lecture by talking about this precariousness. Well, it's a precarious garden, and, and so this idea that the island is a garden. Uh, it used to be that the model was that, that it, we were the garden province, and a garden is something that has to be preserved and protected as a special as a special place. And that means development has to be seen within the context of preserving the garden, and that makes for a lot of political debate about 
what's the right thing for the province to do and how is it going to uh, succeed and, and where should it go. Uh, even something as that would seem as obvious as the Confederation Bridge, which, by the way, is an engineering marvel, uh, a fantastic uh, structure, which has which has made uh, uh, travel and, and uh, trade and commerce on the island considerably easier, particularly in winter, no longer being dependent on the ferries. Um, this was regarded with great suspicion by a lot of people in Prince Edward Island as something that would, would take away from the pristine nature of the island as garden. Uh, that's a picture of the Confederation Bridge in the winter, and you see the, the ice below it. But that's the uh, that's just a, uh, a random picture that I found, but nevertheless, I think gives you the idea of the Garden Island that, uh, that people worry about and, and uh, want to preserve. So um, I'm going to conclude with this this question: uh, Why do you suppose Prince Edward Island would? persist in being a separate province, being very small, having such a small population, having an uncertain economic future, uh, not having a, a lot of, uh, of places, to, a lot of room to grow uh, or, or access to resources. Uh, why not, for example, join with the other maritime provinces and, and form one province? This, after all, was the original intention of the Charlottetown Conference. Uh, it's a really good question. Um, I've lived in all three provinces, in all three maritime provinces. Uh, I'm from New Brunswick, uh, but I lived in Nova Scotia for some time, and now I live here in Prince Edward Island. I've been here for a couple of years. I tend to see myself more as a maritimer with, with affinity to all three provinces. Uh, but I will tell you that on the, on the island, you would be hard-pressed to find people who would support the maritime union movement as logical and as sensible as it, as it might seem. Um, and I suspect the reason why is a fear of a loss of control uh, it, it's, it's interesting because they don't have a lot of control over their economy uh, and there's a lot of things they don't have a lot of control that you don't have when you're small uh, but there's still this idea that, that there's something to be held on to in Prince Edward Island that uh, needs preserving and that if, if it's not if they don't have direct control through the through, through a provincial government uh, other people from off island as they would say uh, will make decisions that will be to the detriment of the, of the, uh, of the island uh, and identity politics is wrapped up in that very strong sense of island identity, uh, which is probably stronger than, than what you would find in, in, in most of the provinces, with possible exception of Newfoundland and Quebec, I, I would argue, in terms of seeing themselves very rooted in, in Prince Edward Island uh, and, and not seeing themselves as part of a larger group. It's not particularly logical, frankly. It's an emotional argument. Uh, and it, and uh, uh, in my mind, it's to the detriment of the of the economic uh, and political uh, survival of the province that is very strong and it's something that, that doesn't doesn't seem to go away. Um, and that it, uh, it remains unpopular despite uh, every once in a while, uh, every 20 years or so, the Maritime Union debate uh, re-emerges and uh, lots of discussion that never seems to go anywhere. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, there's our beautiful flag and uh, get back to the the screen and then uh, be ready to answer your questions. Great, thanks Don. We covered a lot of ground there and I appreciate uh, you taking the time again to tell us a little bit about PEI politics. We're really a province that's not really well known outside of the maritime region and even as you suggested off the island. The outsider's perspective on, on politics there can be very different uh, from those that actually live there. So thanks for that. Very well. I think I just build on some I wonder if you could just build on some of your comments off the, off the beginning. You talked about how um, premiers on the island uh, pride themselves as being national players, and I, I, you know, you, you made reference to uh, Joe Giz and 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 his role in in the uh, uh, Meech Lake and Charlottetown rounds of of uh, constitutional negotiation. Of course, he made a name for himself then. And now his his son, um, Premier Giz, is making a uh, a name for himself on the national stage as well. And uh, for those that aren't familiar, uh, there are countless uh, intergovernmental conferences that have been uh, held or are being held this year in PEI. Um, everything from uh, tourism and culture ministers to, I believe, we had um, uh, education ministers meeting there as well. And the Council of the Federation meeting is coming up at the end of the month. Uh, as well. They're all being held there as part of this year-long celebration, as you mentioned, of, of the Charlottetown Conference of 1864. But beyond that, uh, are you seeing uh, any indication uh, that, that 
the new premier gives, the younger, is is looking to make for a name for himself on the national stage. Is there any indication that he either has aspirations for uh, national office or that uh, he, he's actually using his national profile as chair of the Council of the Federation and so on to um, you, you know to, to, to make him more popular back on the island? That, that's a, it's a good question. Uh, I, I I do see a lot of indications that he that he's looking that way. Um, I'd, be, I'd be surprised if he was not. He's a he's 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 a, he's a bright fellow. He's still very young. Uh, he's got a lot of ambition, uh, and uh, there's only so far he can go, you know, in a small place like Prince Edward Island. Uh, and uh, so I'd be surprised if he did not have that kind of ambition. Uh, it is still extremely difficult, though, to make that that transition. And uh, other premiers, I'm thinking of Frank McKenna in, in New Brunswick, uh, have been uh, uh, labeled as, as the next the next great, uh, you know, liberal leader, for example, or the next great federal politician. Uh, and it hasn't exactly worked out. It's, for whatever reason, they, they, they stop short or, 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 or things get uh, get thwarted. So it's not simple to do. Uh, uh, one of the reasons why uh, premiers like uh, Giz um, are popular within um, parties like the Liberals or, 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 or in, in, in the same thing happens with the Conservatives, of course, um, is ironically enough because they have a small constituency. In other words, uh, no one's jealous of them. So, so uh, 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 an Ontario premier that went to the national scene um, would be regarded with suspicion, perhaps. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm going to guess by British Columbia voters. Is he really interested in our our concerns when he's got that big Ontario interest uh, hanging uh, hanging over his head? Whereas a premier of a small province, well, it's it's it's, it's so small that, that it's it's not going to be a significant uh, player at all. So that that could be part of it. Um, but the the other side of of, of this uh, situation is that. Uh, islanders love it to love to think, and, and, and I would say the Maritimers in general love to think that their premiers from small provinces are able to hold their own at a at a maritime at a, sorry at a, at a, at a, um, a federal premiers conference with, with 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 premiers from you know Alberta and, and British Columbia, and they love seeing them on the news, you know, uh, t talking, speaking with with them as equals. Um, I would suspect that behind closed doors, though, uh, there's there's there is a lot of uh, politeness. But they're not taken all that seriously uh, because they simply don't have uh, the responsibility that, that a premier from a large province does. So one of the arguments in favor of maritime union, for example, is that a premier of a, of a United Maritime province would have a lot more clout than even the three premiers of the three pre the, the provinces do right now. Um, interesting question dynamics, I suppose. Great, and we got some questions rolling in on the provincialpolitics.blogspot.ca uh, blog, and one of them, it, uh, one particular commenter is insistent on on following up on your comments about the NDP uh, not being competitive on on the island and and not having a reasonable prospect for seats in the next election. Um, you know, looking from again from the outside, pu public opinion polls lately, um, and take public opinion polls for what they are, especially in a small uh, small sample sizes in most provinces and even smaller uh, in the case of Prince Edward Island, but the trends that we're seeing suggest that uh, New Democrat support is is fairly solid at at least one in four, 25 percent, and as high as up to one third in the latest CRA poll. Yeah. Um, and and you're, you're, you said off the top that you thought that this might be uh, an aberration or uh, that it won't translate into seats. I wonder if you might just expand a bit on that. Yeah, it's something that I would so much love to see other uh, parties win seats. It's not healthy to have the same old parties win seats election after election after election. Uh, it, the cynicism that this creates is, is not good for anyone. Uh, and, and when I was in New Brunswick, we had, we had the same situation with the NDP. A brilliant dynamic leader, Elizabeth Weir, you know, was able to win one seat, and, and she was a refreshing change in that, in that assembly. It was terrific. But it couldn't translate into any more than that. Eventually, that seat, she resigned, but eventually that seat was lost. So we see these trends, and they're encouraging for those of us who would like to see more diversity in the assembly. But we're, our our aspirations, our optimism is always thwarted when it comes to the election. Uh, and and you know, frankly, the problem is the first past the post system is just so cruel to those parties. So if they can maintain that level of support and at the 25 to 30 percent, which which is absolutely huge for the NDP. Uh, in this region anywhere. Nova Scotia, by the way, is the exception because they, they, they do now seem to have three equal parties, so the NDP got hammered in the last election. 
Um, but uh, in New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island, if they, could, if they can maintain that, that, that level of support, and, and here's the crucial one, where it depends where that support is. So um, if they spread that support evenly across the province, uh, even if they get up to, to wonderful levels like 30%, it still probably won't translate into seats. However, if it's focused in one particular area so that, it, so that it's actually much more you know, in those ridings, then there's a possibility. And here's where there's, there is some glimmer of hope, and it's ironic because if you would think, given what I'm going to tell you, that it should be the Green Party that, that is benefiting from this, not the NDP, but there's been an ongoing controversy in uh, Prince Edward Island called Plan B, and Plan B is simply a name for a highway project that is meant to, uh, that has tried to straighten out the Trans-Canada Highway from Gordon Carleton up through the Bonshaw, and it's actually a very small section of the highway that goes all the way from Gordon Carleton to, uh, to Charlottetown that they, that they wanted to straighten, but they did it through a beautiful old world forest that was a park, uh, and, and for reasons that, that, for those of us who aren't big supporters of Plan B, I suppose, uh, um, don't seem to make a lot of sense. You know, it's going to shave off, you know, minutes off the drive. Well, why? Why does that? Well, why would that warrant uh, uh, cutting through a, a beautiful old world forest like that? So there was a lot of a lot of controversy with that. A lot of protests. The Green Party were front and center uh, in the protests. People saw them every day. They were there, you know, talking about the environmental impact. The NDP support that grew as a consequence, and, and, and uh, uh, they were the ones that benefited from it. So if the NDP support in that area is, is strong, then, then there's a possibility. But, you know, I'm speaking from, you know, many, many, many years of watching maritime politics, and I've seen this pattern over and over and over again, where the NDP get to a certain point where it looks like they're going to have a breakthrough, and then it doesn't happen. Uh, Nova Scotia might be, might be the aberration, but I think New Brunswick and uh, Prince of the Island are the, are the, are the rule. And, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an argument for some form of proportional representation, or at least a hybrid, uh, I suppose. But it's, uh, so far, the system has, has, has not allowed uh, that breakthrough to, to translate into seats, and I'm not uh, optimistic that it's going to be anytime soon. Well, that's a good, way, good segue into the, to the next question from the blog, which is, um, what happened in the 2005 electoral reform referendum? Um, not only was uh, the was electoral reform uh, rejected um, by the PEI electorate, but um, if memory serves, less than less than forty percent of Islanders actually voted in that particular referendum, which is really really odd considering the high level of voter turnout in that particular election and elections in general in PEI. Yeah, I, I wasn't living here then, so, so I'm saying this secondhand. But there's an excellent paper by Peter McKenna, a colleague of mine at the University of Prince of Island. Which he tried to analyze that result, and his argument was that basically um, the government itself, the then government, got cold feet, weren't happy with, with, with the direction it was going, and thwarted uh, the the, uh, the campaign on, on several fronts, uh, including limiting the campaign, uh, limiting spending on, on the on the yes side, uh, and and then making the the um, presentations far more complicated than uh, was palatable, and, and basically preached the. Uh, uh, you know, you really want to have a change that we don't understand what the consequences are going to be. You know, why would we want to keep the way the way we have it? So, so not a not not a, a fairly run campaign. That, that's at least uh, the analysis of of my colleague, and uh, he's he's probably right. Um, these electoral reform commissions uh, have not done well in in Canada, as you know. Uh, some have uh, had more support than others, but uh, there's very few reforms that have actually come out of any of them. Uh, they, 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 they always get presented by the no side as uh, an overcomplication and a, and a lot and, and a um, process is going to become more bureaucratic, more rule oriented, and, and and voters will have less less control over over the outcome. Um, not a fair assessment whatsoever to what's being proposed, but that, that seems to be the winning message if you're trying to uh, you're trying to defeat these, and that's pretty well what happened here. Good. Um just shifting gears a bit, one of the themes that we've noticed as we make this cross-Canada journey, and especially in Eastern Canada, is this question about political culture change. And um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Ian Stewart's writings about Nova Scotia in particular, of how that that province's image as a traditionalist, small-c, conservative political culture uh, is undeserved today. And we heard in our lecture from uh, Mario Levesque as part of this 
uh, this lecture series here that New Brunswick's image as a traditionalist, small c conservative political culture is undeserving. Is PEI's political culture shifting at all? We got a sense from your talk that you, you that you think not. I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but if I could put it in into context, one of the things that keeps coming up is the issue of, of abortion. And I know that as one of our um, commenters said today, there's a maternal women's um, maternal health conference held in PEI today on the topic and. Um, on public policy issues like that, it seems like conservatism, small c conservatism, is alive and well on the island. Is that your sense? Yeah, I'm not sure that's the example I would use. Uh, this, this is a conference on, on reproductive justice that you're talking about, the international conference at UPI. Uh, and so you, there is obviously a strong um, core of, of, of anti-abortionists on the island, as, as, as you'll find in, in, any, in, any, in any province. Uh, I'm not sure there are more here. Uh, it certainly has 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 uh, not translated. It has tra it has maintained a policy in which which uh, island women have to go off the island to to uh, to, to have abortions. So so governments have, have maintained a status quo, uh, you know, which for which they've been they've been criticized quite a bit. But um, that aside, uh, maybe I haven't been here long enough to to. to Give you a, a really accurate assessment of the small C conservatism, uh, but my assessment so far is that that uh, uh, the province has not moved forward in in the way in which New Brunswick and the Nova Scotia has. So it it, it have it, it is still, in other words, a province that uh, likes things to be the way that, that they were and and to, to hold on to to, to to the way they things things the way they were, uh, and not a lot of interest in, in new things. Um, it's you know it's hard to, it's hard to, to pick up a, a, which may be a vocal minority and then suggest that you can extrapolate that for the province as a whole. But a common theme in the letters to the editor in, in the Guardian uh, is well you know do we really need someone from off the island coming telling us what to do? And you see that over and over and over again. And, and so that seems to, that seems to have a have, have a resonance uh, amongst amongst a lot of people. Um, so uh, traditional yes uh, like things to be. To be Keep the same. That's part of the preservation of the garden, by the way. It's, it's, it's thoughtful as well as as a, as a, a kind of a visceral reaction to, to, to what's going on. Modernity is, is problematic. Uh, I think a lot of people might even agree with that. that modernity uh, requires us to, to we have to look at that and reconsider our values and, and see who, what kind of people we are. Um, but politically, uh, no, I don't see a lot of radicalism. Don't see a lot of interest in that. In, in, in promoting causes that, 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 are, that are seen as disruptive. Uh, New Brunswick has a politics of protest that, that is quite powerful, and you see that over and over and over again. Don't see the same, the same uh, phenomenon on the island. Um, so I don't think we're there yet. I, I, I think the small sea reserve is still, still applies pretty well to Brazil Island. All right, and our, our last question is, on, on what you actually closed your talk on this this issue of maritime union and um, you know we don't, we only gave you 20 minutes here to talk about a whole slew of issues with um, related to PEI politics and I don't want to leave our listeners with the impression that maritime union is is all or nothing that it requires a full legislative and even constitutional combination of, of these provinces maritime provinces into a single jurisdiction there there's a lot of room for um, institutional cooperation, uh, collaboration, and I guess the question is ha have these, I know the provinces haven't moved towards formal union, um, but have you seen any evidence of uh, moving towards harmonization or, or collaboration in recent years, and is there room for more? There's a lot of room for more, and there's a lot of talk about harmonization and very little action. So, uh, as I said, the maritime union movement takes place with every generation. There's there's a, another push for it, but go back to 1970 when the when maritime, the famous maritime union report came out, uh, and what and when the very, one of the very first things that was was this, uh, created was the Council of Maritime Premiers. And the Council of Maritime Premiers was going to oversee a comprehensive uh, program of of harmonization and cooperation and uh, all sorts of different things that would that even if they didn't join politically. Into, into form one one uh, province uh, would have the same benefits from, from that. So we wouldn't be competing; we'd be cooperating. Uh, that was 1970. Uh, the only thing that actually came out of it uh, was the Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission, uh, which overs has oversight over higher education in the three provinces. 
and that commission uh, has has had its mandate changed several times. It's going through a mandate change right now, and basically, uh, instead of, of using uh, uh, the system of higher education as a as a social innovation uh, a tool that, as it was promised back in 1970, it's it's the organization where you, if you want to change your major, you have to send in in your forms to to, to them to, to make sure that. Uh, they, they, they think it fits with their quality assurance program. They facilitate bulk purchases for you know, photocopiers. Uh, so a lot of the promises for the, the cooperative um, um, measures that, that could take place, that should take place, uh, that everybody, everybody knows would be, would, be, would be much better off if they did take place, don't take place. And the reason is that eventually you have a, a premier and a cabinet making decisions that, that, that if they have to, they'd be saying, you know, We'd all be better off if Nova Scotia did not do X and we let New Brunswick do it, uh, and that doesn't fly with voters, uh, and so they know they know that's not going to work, so they, they don't do that. So government after government after government has paid lip service to the cooperation, but frankly, I, I still don't see an awful lot of it. Uh, glimmers here and there, little flickers, but uh, nothing that, of the scale that was promised back in 1970, and the, uh, and the, and and not much indication that's going to that's going to change anytime soon. Great. Well, thanks for joining us tonight, Don. I especially appreciate it considering that uh, it's it's three hours behind Alberta time, so this is very late in the evening. I really do very appreciate it. Very late in the evening, too. That's right. Yeah. I'm an early to bed, early to rise kind of guy. So. <laughs> well, I'll, uh, I owe you. I, I, I owe you one. Thanks for joining us. I, I can't think of a better way to wrap up our ca Across Canada tour than discussion about maritime union. Uh, so I appreciate that and uh, hope you have a great evening. Thanks, man. Thanks. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.